So hi, uh, I'm Kira, um, and this is the SciPy Tools Plenary, uh, also co-chaired by Madigan over there, and Thomas Caswell, who is uh, not with us in person. But this is basically just a like an opportunity for various projects in the ecosystem to give a quick update of like you know what happened over the past year, any highlights they had, etc. So. Up first, we're gonna have Scikit-Learn, uh, presented by Thomas J. Fong. Okay. Hi, I'm Thomas. I'm a maintainer for Scikit-Learn. I'm gonna give an update on Scikit-Learn for SciPy 2023. Since SciPy 2022, there's been two updates, 1.2, 1.3. I'll go over them as through these slides. Number one, History and grading boosting is Scikit-Learn's version of LightGPM. It has interaction constraints now. Um, we have many different visualizations, um, one of which is the prediction error display, which plots the actual values with predicted values. We have another one called learning curve display, which plots the a metric while you change the, um, the size of your training data. There's also partial dependence displays, which um, now has categorical feature support, so now it just works with categoricals. If for those who are familiar with Fetch OpenML, um, this using a pandas parser, now it's faster. Um, this one um, is really cool. We take advantage of Ray API, and now in Scikit-Learn 1.2, we introduced it, and in 1.3, we added PyTorch support. So you can run certain models in Scikit-Learn with a GPU on PyTorch. So really cool. With a context manager, you can see this. You just use context manager, context manager, it just works. Things are faster all around. So these things, these estimators and functions here, faster. <laughs> Upgrade, you get wins. This is also really cool. I, I worked on this for around three to four years with different APIs. This, is, this allows scikit-learn transformers to output pandas data frames. There's an API for it. It's called set output. It works. Great. 1.3. Um, we have experimental metadata routing, which it's, um, it's a new API that enables use cases that were not possible before, like nested group cross-validation. HTTP scan, hierarchical density-based clustering is now part of um, Scikit-Learn. Our decision trees support missing values, and I'm hoping the next version it will, do, it will also support viruses, but now it supports decision trees have um, native missing value support. Um, validation curve display changes a pipe parameter and graphs a metric. It, it's a nice plot. Um, gamma, there's a gamma loss now in histogram grading boosting regressor. Um, it's very nice for waiting times and for um, modeling waiting times. Our known coder now supports infrequent categories, so it groups together infrequent categories and makes them one category. Target encoder uses the targets to encode categories, and it does cross-validation in internally so that you don't have any data leakage. So that's 1.3. These are all the contributors for 1.2, 1.3. I'd like to thank all the contributors out, uh, out there to, that made Scikit-Learn possible. Thank you so much for that update, Thomas. Uh, I think the ability to use the array API will be super exciting. Um, up next, we have Tiled, presented by Dan Allen. Thank you, Kara. It is so nice to be here. I'm talking about a relatively new project coming out of the National Labs. Tiled is a remote data access service for scientific data structures. It's designed to operate on arrays, tables, nested structures of these, especially when you have a variety of sizes and shapes and maybe formats you're stuck with because that's what the detector writes or that's the format that your community has built some trust around. But remotely, you can search and slice this data to get exactly what you need, and you can get it in the format that makes sense for your task. So if you've got a Python program, you might just want a block of a C-ordered buffer that you can drop straight into NumPy without touching disk, or maybe Apache Arrow. On the other hand, if you're a web app, you might want to slice into some four-dimensional array and get a PNG, maybe downsampled. Or you might want 
a link to a TIFF that you can send to your colleague who would just really like a TIFF. So this is designed to support open data portals where everyone can see the data, research groups that have a small prescribed set of people with access, and larger facilities and collaborations with complex rules around who can do what to which data. Uh, you can run it on your laptop or on a lab server. So there are the links, and they'll be on the next slide, too. You can give that a try. It also scales like a horizontally scaled web app for larger facilities. So you, you kick it off by either pointing it at files that you already have, or you give it some writable area where you're going to be uploading some data. And when you connect to it from its Python client, it feels a lot like going into a dictionary or using H5Py. But of course, instead of reading metadata and data from disk, it's doing HTTP calls under the hood. And unlike the purpose-built data services for ZAR or XRA or HDF5, it's not tied to any particular format back there. And that could be CSVs or something else, something exotic under the hood. You can search and you can export. And that export is happening on the server. So I can get an H5Py for my colleague, even if I don't have uh, H5Py installed. It's using web standards that many web programs understand for things like authentication and caching and specifying formats and compression. So you don't just use it from Python. You can use it from curl. We have scientists and users we know of who've integrated it with Igor and other graphical applications. There's a prototype with Napari. So the links are there. Uh, please give it a try and be noisy. We're sort of converting from club status to something a little bit bigger in this phase, and we'd love to hear from people. Thanks for the time. Hi, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I met Dan like a few weeks ago, and he showed me Tal, and I was like so excited to be able to use like Python to, uh, you know, API to be able to do all sorts of HTTP GET requests and all sorts of stuff. I thought it's super cool. But anyways, uh, now we have Czar presented by Josh Moore. Good morning, everyone. And this is good timing, so I'm looking forward to getting a chance to talk to Dan. Czar, a, a NumFocus sponsored project. Uh, if you don't know, and you have either mini arrays that you need to serialize to disk, or you have a very large array that's too big for your memory, or you have ZAR uh, arrays that are off in the cloud and too slow to access. ZAR is a format, kind of that Dan mentioned, that you might want to store your data ads, and you could sh should still be able to use Tile then on top of it. Um, last year, John Kirkham gave an update and talked about the CZI funding that we had that helped us to fund a community manager, manager position, that's Sankate, who's here, um, and, and about the enhancement process, proposal process that we were developing. Since then, the first enhancement proposal, ZEP1, which defined the new version of the language of the format, has been accepted. And so the Implementation Council, which is this interesting body that we'll be talking about on Thursday, is off implementing the new version. Um, up next, so just after the summer, we'll be voting on ZEP2, which is talking about sharding this feature for optimizing how the data is stored. Currently, most of the work on those exploratory ZEPs is taking place in a new library called Scalable Minds slash Zarita. You can pip install that and have a play with the new formats before everything gets rolled into the, the main Zar Python library. There have been some minor releases of Zar Python primarily focused on performance. One, being able to load, say, um, your arrays directly into a GPU-backed array, or, for example, um, being able to read the chunks of the, your array in parallel. Interestingly, there's also a very large 2.13.4 release where the Outreachy and GZOC contributors just jumped on board and did lots of very small, great things for the project, and that was great to see. You can highly suggest doing that um, if you have time. As a separate kind of body of work, we're working on gathering from the community various um, resources for the web page. One is getting logos of the adopters. Another is gathering data sets that are available, either you know, terabyte, petabyte scale things that are out there, or conventions, which are ways that various communities are using ZAR and trying to publish all that. So if you have examples, do get in touch with us. You can do that by coming to the office hours, and there's a calendar for that, or of course, reaching us through any of the normal channels, including a calendar with all of our other weekly meetings. Thanks.
Thank you for that, Josh. Yeah, it's our super cool. Uh, due to the way it's organized, you can like, it's really easy to read chunks since it's a directory format. So um, up next, we have Psychic Bill presented by Henry Schreiner. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about Scikit Build. This is a project that has had a, a long uh, history with SciPy. It was announced as PyCMake in SciPy 2014. It was renamed as to Scikit Build in 20, SciPy 2016. And it's really grown into a, a family of, of tools. So first, just a quick update on the classic Scikit Build. Uh, this is a, a set of tools wrapper that allows you to take your, um, your code, use a CMake build system, and then just stick something in a setup.py to make it work. Uh, we've really been focusing on a new backend, but there has been, have been some updates here. We've been um, slowly modernizing this. We've been adding support for the um, newer versions of, of CMake's Find Python and adding various uh, other platforms. But most of the focus has been on Scikit Build Core, which is a brand new build backend designed for um, modern versions of CMake and Python. And it has a, a long list of features over the original Scikit build. Probably the uh, most important one to me, though, is that this is all it requires in order to use it. So this is a uh, example pyproject.toml. And um, uh, just replace uh, nanobind with pybind11 there if you want this to work. Uh, I grabbed this from two different examples, unfortunately. Uh, and then a CMake list. This is a CMake, the CMake list for it. And then finally, a, a little file. These three files are enough to make a built Python package that you can um, run. You can just um, you can uh, build and run just just with this. So no setup.py, no manifest.in, no um, setup.config, or anything like that. Uh, there are some examples of of these uh, of packages that have started using Scikit-Build Core. Awkward Array now uses it. Iminui uses it. Light LightGBM uses it. Uh, there's also a nanobind example, so uh, if you want to learn about the difference between PyBind 11 and nanobind, you can uh, come to the tools plenary on Friday. But the nanobind example uses scikit build, uh, scikit build core and does some very, very neat things with it. Uh, and then also the new learn.scientificpython.org uh, pages cover several different backends, including scikit build core. And you'll hear about that a little bit in the next talk. There are other uh, members of this of the Scikit-Build family, so just give you a quick update on those. Um, CMake now ships uh, Windows ARM wheels, and uh, fairly soon we're going to start requiring Python 3.7 for um, at least building them, maybe re maybe uh, running the wheels entirely. Um, the reason for that you can probably guess. They're moving over to Scikit-Build Core. Uh, also, GitHub is killing Python 2.7 um, for testing. Uh, we also have, uh, we work on the modern CMake domain, which comes out of, of CMake. There's some uh, nice updates coming in 3.27. That's a tool that allows you to uh, document your CMake code in Sphinx. Uh, and then we're also working on dynamic metadata. So um, if you're interested in that, we're standardizing that. And there's also some new examples. Okay. And then some future plans. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Henry. Uh, we actually have Henry presenting every single day this week. Uh, I promise we're not biased. It's just how things worked out. Um, but you know, good on him for being a core dev of so many cool different projects. Uh, up next, we have the Scientific Python Ecosystem Coordination thing. I'm bad at words. Uh, and it's, the update's going to be by Jared Millman. Thank you, Kara. Um, so I'm just going to start use my slides, I suppose. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, just a little history. So uh, I'll skip the very early prehistory, where around 2000, the first sort of decade of scientific Python or SciPy, uh, really the brand name was SciPy. Um, SciPy.org, the website, was sort of a landing page for the entire ecosystem. Um, the SciPy conference was really the main coordinating mechanism of the development of the scientific Python ecosystem. Uh, it was a much smaller conference, and the only people that attended were all the core developers. Uh, we didn't have a large user community outside the core developers at that point. Um, then, uh, just to give you a sense of how core this idea of SciPy was, uh, when Numeric and NumRay were being uh, merged into what is now called NumPy that everyone uses and love, uh, we, for quite a while, were 
uh, calling that SciPy core. Uh, and then we had this idea of building these scikits on top of it. Uh, some of the early ones were scikit image and scikit um, uh, learn. Uh, there's lots of others now. And you know, these scikits were sort of the idea that you know, a lot of the traditional packages like MATLAB or commercial projects had sort of the unified ecosystem where they had uh, a core with uh, these toolboxes on top and we were trying to replicate that. Uh, by 2010, we had just a rapid growth in the community and the user base and uh, it was taking off everywhere. And uh, that model was being um, strained. Uh, the scipy.org was becoming a, a confusing landing page for the ecosystem because uh, you know, some people were going there to find out about the scipy library, uh, but when you got there, it first started talking about all kinds of other things and you had to actually go uh, in a couple levels before you found out about the library. It also became unwieldy in terms of uh, management and who was in control of things and how things would get updated. A lot of things sort of uh, decayed and, uh, that, that over time. Uh, the conference, uh, as you see, has grown to be a, a really uh, dynamic and great event, uh, but just with the number of people who are the first time, uh, you can imagine this is not a conference now where it's a small group of core developers sitting around hashing out uh, how the library should uh, work and interoperate. Um, also, the notion of the, this core idea and the stack even became strained. Uh, now it's a lot more domain specific and there's a bunch of stacks and it's much more this ecosystem instead of just a, a tree itself, although we use this tree metaphor. Um, and then uh, around 2020, uh, right as the pandemic was hitting, uh, uh, a couple of us sort of started thinking about uh, dealing with this. I, some of the original ideas were of 2018, uh, 2019, but by 2020 there's some funding to launch this. Um, and the idea was that the Scientific Python project would uh, better coordinate the ecosystem and support the community of contributors and developers. And so we're supporting the users, but really uh, the users need to have uh, a coordinated ecosystem with uh, the developers and maintainers uh, doing a, uh, the work in a very nice way. Um, at the end of 2020, uh, around November, we launched the Scientific Python org website. Uh, and then uh, in around 2001, we launched these things called specs, which are coordination documents. Uh, these are recommendations. So if you're a project and looking for something, it's a recommendation. Um, and then we had developer summits in 2023. Uh, we've got a bunch of specs and we'll be talking more about this uh, today later uh, at 115. Rec recommend you all come there. Uh, we'll be talking about specs, and um, we'll also be talking about some of these uh, highlighted features here. Um, okay, uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, um, just had the Scientific Python Developer Summit a few weeks ago. That is where I met Dan and Henry, actually. Um, really, really helpful. Uh, also, be sure to check out Juanita's talk at 115, as Jared said. Okay, up next, uh, we have an update on Numba by Stan Siebert. Alrighty, <clears throat> apologies for the voice. So yeah, uh, this year has been uh, a lot of, um, I would say, oh, I should back up. So Numba, if you're not familiar with, is a Python just-in-time compiler for numerical applications. So if you have a function that does a lot of math and NumPy stuff and you stick a decorator on it, we can probably make it as fast as C or Fortran without you having to switch languages. Maybe faster if you use some of the multi-threading or GPU uh, features in it. Um, because Numba integrates with so many different things, NumPy, Python, and LLVM, uh, it is a constant race to try and keep up with all of the churn and all those things. So this year, a lot of effort uh, early on went into finishing off support for Python 3.11 and NumPy 1.24. Um, also, a bunch of other things got improved, things with the random generator interface, but also updating to CUDA 12, new LLVM. Um, we recognized that the time it took us to support Python 3.11 was too long. Uh, keeping up with bytecode changes is challenging. Uh, and so for the last year, we've been working on a better front end in order to allow us to update now that Python's coming out every year. We need to be able to keep up with it. So um, you can look forward to later this year. Uh, in about a month, we'll have um, 0.58 with NumPy 1.25 support. Uh, we're looking in uh, 0.59, which will be sort of end of this year, early 2024, to get Python 3.12 support out uh, with way fewer delays. And this is based on a, a new front end, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. We're updating our usage of LLVM to keep up with things. And we're working very closely with the NumPy developers. If you haven't heard NumPy 2.0 is coming, NumPy 2.0 is coming. Um, <laughs> you should be excited and terrified in equal measure. 
So um, we're, we're on board with that. Hopefully, we're all going to get on board with that. Um, and there are some things that are going away. Uh, sorry for those of you using 32-bit windows. Um, we gave up. Um, the old versions are still there for you. Uh, and then we're also getting ready to remove object mode because it never really did anything that anyone wanted. Um, but the thing I do want to shout out is uh, actually uh, plus 100 to the keynote this morning. The, those issues and things have been in our brains for a few years and kind of incubating into uh, a thing we formally announced in February, which is that we're, while continuing to support the old stuff, obviously, um, into doing a major rework of the compiler. We're basically decomposing the, the number compiler into components um, because one thing we've noticed is that a lot of projects need a little bit of compiler. Maybe not a whole compiler, but some piece of a compiler. And so taking Numba apart will both make it easier to develop and easier to integrate in other things. So we're actually stepping that, taking that effort and looking at an ahead of time compiler as the target because it turns out an ahead of time compiler is harder to make than a just in time compiler. Um, not something we really expected, but as we looked at it more, we really need to kind of start there. Um, and there are new components. I mentioned the new front end. This is basically going to be a standalone package that can take Python bytecode and turn it into a control flow structure suitable for uh, analysis, transformation, whatever kind of compilery thing you might be thinking. Um, this is going to be separately installable from Numba. It's just pure Python. It will be uh, pretty lightweight if you want to incorporate it into your project. Another thing which I encourage you to check out the QR code, um, we have a demo up of a uh, thing we're calling Pixie which is a play on related to ELF. Uh, Pixie is uh, a different way, or a, a, a way of sticking uh, things into a shared library, so it's still an ELF, um, that enables you to do ahead of time and just in time compilation very, very fast. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, check out the demo. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. Um, sorry to have to cut you off. Uh, it's just, I, I, do, I do love Numba, but got to get to other projects too. True, true. OK, um, so next up, we have Scikit Image by uh, Juan Nunez Iglesias. Hello. Um, OK, so I was supposed to be joined here by other Scikit Images, but that's fine. Um, OK, so we were told two slides, and we stuck to the two slides, uh, unlike other projects. Um, but. <laughs> In order to uh, fit more information, uh, you can go to that link and click on the slide and click on the links if you want to hear more. All right. Uh, so we've done a couple of releases uh, with better anisotropy support. So if you have data you know, where your Z slices are not spaced the same as your pixels, uh, it's now easier to um, get useful information out of second image. Um, so we're really leaning into um, you know, being better for measurement, because a lot of the segmentation stuff, while still useful, uh, you know, a lot of people have deep learning pipelines that they use, but you still ultimately want to get measurements out of your objects. Um, so now you can add spacing to get to your region props, and in the future, uh, we will add unit support. Um, find some example, hopefully it will work with any kind of uh, array API compliant quantity. Um, we've got a new build chain, which I know nothing about. Thanks, Jared. <laughs> um, and uh, we got some ESS5 funding, which I will talk about in the next slide. Um, so we're doing two outreachy projects, which are really good. Um, and we're working on a new API. So um, yeah, good talk about API, Michael. Um, and um, the key is that, yeah, you can't break anything. So it's going to be a new namespace, SK Image 2. Um, and the idea is to have protocols for very common functions. So for example, a segmentation function is something that uh, takes in an image, some other parameters, and produces a segmentation image or a label image. Um, so for that, we want to use a PEP. I forget the PEP number, but protocols. Um, but there's sort of some quirks around them. Um, so if you're like really into typing, um, then please help us. Um, and Lars Guder is uh, primarily uh, funded by um, CVI OSS, and he's kind of, yeah hacking away at this SK image 2 thing, and if you want to help out, we would super appreciate it. That's it. 